First John chapter 1 from verse 1. Recently I began to contemplate. I see a lot of activities. I see a lot of ministries. I see a lot of churches. I see a lot of pastors, which I'm one of. And I began to wonder if truly we are growing as believers. And so the Lord began to trouble my heart to find out what his expectation is concerning his children. When you start studying the scripture, there are two major emphases that we stand out. Two major emphases. The first is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. He said, to which God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, but he gave unto them the word of reconciliation. You will see that God's burden is to see that no sinner perishes, but that the whole world comes to the knowledge of the truth, and so that they are exonerated from death and from the judgment that is to come. It is on that note that God ordains ministers to go into the world and to reconcile people back to him and to save them from the penury of a dying world. The second emphasis you will find that stands out is in Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11 to verse 16. He said to some he gave to be apostles, to some he gave to be prophets, to some he gave to be evangelists, to some he gave to be pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. And then he gave us seven levels of growth that every believer should mature into. I don't have time to deal with that. But the point I'm making is that the second burden in the heart of God is for us to grow. In fact, when you come to verse 16, where it ended it, it said that we shall grow into him in all things, even Christ, the head of the church. And so the burden in the heart of God is for every Christian to come into spiritual maturity until he becomes like a visible expression of the Christos. And so when you touch a Christian, you touch Jesus. The reason it is necessary for us to gather together in the first place is not about the excellence or the aesthetics. The reason we gather is to furnish a people with light to a degree that every one of us begins to represent a dimension of Christ. And so when you meet believers, you are supposed to be touching the invincible God through physical vessels. And so all our spiritual engagements and enterprises are designed to bring us into maturity. And so when you find a Christian, you shouldn't be so moved as to which denomination he belongs to. You should actually be moved because his life has become a reflection of God. In fact, these two realities are also the factors that defined Jesus' existence. The Bible was speaking in Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. And it said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He said, hath in this last day spoken to us by his son, who be the heir of all things. And he said, he is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. And so when you touch Jesus, you have touched the father. When you meet Jesus, you have met the father. When you speak to Jesus, you have spoken to the father. And so the life of Jesus was summarized by his ability to reflect the father. So much so that when you meet Jesus, who the father is will no longer be in doubt. In fact, when Thomas asked him, show us the father that we might know him and see him. He said, have you been with me for this long and you have not known the father? He said, whoever had seen me have seen the father. And so when you meet Jesus, you don't need to travel to heaven to find out who the father is. Jesus is the bodily expression of the invincible God. And when Jesus left this world, his desire 
was for you and I to become the physical expression of Christ. And so the same way Jesus did not have a life, but live to reveal the Father, you and I are not supposed to have a life. Our life is supposed to be a theater that reveals and manifests the possibilities that are in Christ. And so when you meet a Christian and you are still looking for Jesus, then something is wrong. It means that person has a title, but it does not belong to the community of spirit men. Now, when you are talking about fire, fire is not just about praying in a certain way, either praying loud or jumping. That is adrenaline. It's just a sign that you are young. When we are talking about fire, you are looking at something that is deeper than gesticulation. You are looking at something that is deeper than excitement. When you are talking about fire, you are actually considering a kind of hunger and burden in your spirit that everything that is in you that should make you become a reflection of Christ must manifest. That's why when we pray and we dig into the altar, our goal is not the posture. Our goal is not how we pray. Our goal is an attempt to excavate the possibilities of God that is locked up in our spirit. So when we come out, you no longer see us, you see Christ. And so if that is not your body, you don't know why fire is necessary. Because I, I have to be careful. If I begin to stir the energy here, we will lose control of this place. But at the end of the day, if you go back into a weary on Monday, will you find these people who are praying? When you go into the market, are you going to recognize Jesus there? When the disciples of Jesus left him and they walked into the market, they looked at them and they said, these ones have been with Christ. There is something about them that reveals the signature of Jesus Christ. We don't know how they pray. We don't know how they sing. We don't know the books they read. But when we touch them, we touch Christ. In fact, a point came, there was persecution. And the Bible said, the believers migrated from Jerusalem and they traveled as far as Antioch, the region where they went to. They didn't know about the religiosity of Christianity. Nobody knew if there was anything like Christian movement because they were running for their lives. They were hunting Christians in Jerusalem to slaughter them like animals. And so a point came, they had to run. So they came into a Gentile dwelling. They had not heard anything about Christianity. They didn't know about religion. But after a while, when they started touching these people, they didn't trace them to themselves. They trace them to a person and they call them Christians because these ones look like Christ. So they were called lead to Christ. The question tonight is, how are we growing? I know we come to church every week, but we have been Christians for 10 years. How come nobody has met you and said, Kai, there's something about you. Who are you? How come when you came here, I began to feel God? How come when you spoke, I began to sense God? Why are we still so normal? Why are we still so natural? Why is it that we are increasing in number, but the environment is not feeling the weight? Our priority is that there's a church in every street. Our priority is that a whole state is a Christian state. But the question is, when you enter that state, the soul of the state reveals the soul of a serpent. Because you find people who because of money can slaughter. And when they are arrested, you hear that his name is Nathaniel. When did a Nathaniel become a kidnapper? When did a Nathaniel become so callous that they can kill people for 10,000 naira? The question is, where was he baptized? What happened to this Nathaniel? Once upon a time, he accepted Jesus and came for an altar call. Once upon a time, he submitted to Jesus and went to a church and was baptized. How come a man who identifies with Jesus so much as to bear a Christian name is now found among armed robbers? If we go to Afghanistan and we find violence, we can say, okay, the gospel has not gotten there. But there has been Christianity in Oweri for more than 50 years. How come the kidnappers still carry Christian names? How come do the fornicators, the adulterers, if it's 8 p.m., you better not go close to regions where there are hotels because you will find ladies of different skin color. And if you are bold enough to ask them, what is your name? You will discover that the lexicon of names you will find there are all Christian names. And most cases, they walk to church on Sunday with different headgears, different nails and eyelashes. The body glowing like a bulb, but you can't find Christ there. 
And so when we are talking about fire, it's because we are tired of religion. When we are talking about fire, we are tired of number that has no implication territorially. When we are talking about fire, we are pointing to a generation that is asking a question. What did the first apostles know? That only 12 of them turned their walls upside down. When we are talking about fire, we are asking questions that what did men like Paul and Barnabas know? That two of them can enter a city and in less than two weeks, the whole city is shaking. And they said, two strangers came here. What was on their lives? That's the question we want to answer in this conference. That when I walk out of this door, may I not be part of the multitude? But for us to come into these places in God, we must know what God calls growth. We must know what God calls his own standard and align to those standards. Else, we will ordain many pastors that are babes in the spirit. And we'll have many congregations that are confused. And so the reason this age is an apostolic age is because God wants to move the church to higher level of maturity. The original word from whence apostolos was translated is the word where you get admirer that's the highest rank in the navy an admirer is one who leads a fleet of sailors to a destination and so every time god wants to move the body of christ he raises apostles who will bring them spiritual insight into the standards of god and so people we receive new hunger to rise beyond the status quo because our idea of growth now in the kingdom is that we are stars that people gather around us or that we have a title whereas when it has to do with realities in the corridors where immortal spirits who are not moved by titles dwell we don't even have a stake there hope you know that even when Adam fell he was still in the garden like a champion but he had been dethroned from Zion. And God discovered that when the heavenly ecclesia was gathered, his throne was empty. And the man didn't know he was still in the garden until God showed up and now discovered he could no longer interact with the presence. And God said, Adam, where are thou? The question is not that you are missing because God is omniscient. He knows all things, mama. God knows all things. He was not looking for Adam. The question he was asking is, in the galaxies of God, where princes dwell, your throne is vacant. Where are you? How come we can't find your scepter? Your throne is empty. We are looking for legislators. You represent it. Don't you know that if you don't come to assembly, it will be vulnerable? Where are you? It means another prince have ascended that throne. And Adam is no longer a Coriotis. He's no longer a dominion. And so he was still in the garden, but he was no longer appearing where it matters. And so the monarch himself had to walk through the garden and ask him, where are thou? Many are carrying titles, but in the spirit there is vacancy. God is still asking, whom shall I send? Did you not know that a prophet appeared before God? And when he began to see creatures, creatures that have different credentials, because his idea of a prophet is that he was the national prophet. Everybody respected him. He is the oldest among the prophets. And when he said, King Uzziah died, the heavens opened. And he entered the corridors of God and he saw seraphims. They now told him, the power of a prophet is purity. It's not word of knowledge. You can't stand here. He's holy ones that dwell here. And when, when they were looking, they saw him. Before they spoke, himself said, sorry, I'm a man of unclean lips. <laughs> I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Before he was admitted, they had to touch his tongue with the coal of fire. And even after he was poured, God was asking the question, who shall I send? A man has a title of a prophet. He came to God and they are asking, who shall I send? And he said, Lord, I'm here. Send me. I didn't you see my title? Here, we don't bother about titles. You have failed the test. May you not be big on earth and they don't know you in the spirit. That's where you know the meaning of fire. Because fire in that realm was about purity. How come your garment is stained? How come your tongue is filled with lies? Who told you you can appear here? He saw creatures that were covered with eyes. He now discovered the powers of the office that he was speaking from. 
Let's take it gradually. Sit down. When it's a body, it becomes difficult to teach. When it's a body. In 1 John chapter 1, it said that which was from the beginning. Because what we are talking about here is a reality of another age. What we are talking about here is not something that emanated from men. It emanated from another civilization. He said that which was from the beginning. We have heard of it. Some persons are still at the level of what they heard. You heard that prayer is powerful. You heard that a believer is supposed to be the light of the world. The question is, do you know light? Have you shone before? Where is your illumination? And we stand up and go into a dark world with lecture notes. Did you not read? After Jesus ascended, he told his disciples, don't run out and say, I know Jesus. This generation of snapping picture with people. And then you think on the strength of that picture, you can be a witness to your generation. Don't go out and say, I am Peter. I was the one who followed him to the market that day. You will die. He said, tarry until you are endued. Because the things we are teaching you, they are lively economies from another civilization. And so John, having understood it, began to teach us that there was a protocol. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we heard, we saw, we looked upon. He said, now we have handled it. And so there must be a journey from what you have heard to what you have handled. If you have not handled it, then you need fire in order to journey because the, the journey is great. The journey is great. There are many, our number is much because we have heard. We have heard, but we have not handled. And he said, what we handled is the word of life. It's no longer a logos. It has become life. And so when you read that scripture, you will see that John was inviting them into the fellowship. And so what you will glean from it is that the eternal life you received, you will have to travel into it. It was given to you on the crusade ground. But for a lifetime, you will walk into it. And it is the degree that you walk into that life and experience it that determines your relevance in the realm of God. There are many things I would have taken one by one in order to teach us what Christian maturity is about and what God expects of us. So that when you say you are a Christian, don't only read that definition from a foundation school manual. When you say I am a Christian, find out what God considers the believer to be in the spirit and then judge your life and see if you are what God calls a Christian. I was teaching the other day and I told them, most of us say we are men. But the definition of God of men is different. God said, man shall not live by bread alone. So if you are man, you must have access to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you don't have that word, your definition of man may be from biology. In the spirit, they may consider you a servant. You may be a donkey that a demon comes to ride. And that's why many people, spirits, ride them at night. Because they are not men. He said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And so if you are not praying in the realm of God, they don't know you are a man. Because one of the things that makes a spirit recognize that you are a man is the quality of your fraternity with the spirit realm. He said, if you are a man, you ought to pray. Now, you say you are a man and you have not prayed in 10 years. So, your definition of man is actually biology. You have two ears, two eyes, a nose and mouth. In the spirit, they say men pray. And so, if you are not praying, you are what? You are something else from God's perspective. And so, when you are talking about who a Christian is, you need to understand God's standard of a Christian. And then you will now x-ray it with your life and ask yourself, am I a Christian? And there are many articles that the scripture reveal to us that shows who a Christian is. I will just attempt to explain one this night, one. So to show us, when we start talking about fire, you will know why we need it. And you will know the significance of fire is beyond excitement. Many corridors and many parameters for defining a Christian. One is by the quality of life that you have. We are not Christians because we are religious people. We are Christians because there is a life that powers us. And so anybody who says he's a Christian, 
must have mastered the operations of that life. And so it is the results that life produces that qualifies him to be called a believer in the realm of God. Not because he joined the church. You can join a church and be indoctrinated by a church. But in the spirit realm, you are not known. Because when they want to censor the people of God, it is by the life of God that they will be censored. Another parameter that defines who a Christian is, is the kind of faith that you work with. Faith. Another parameter that defines who a Christian is, is the spirit that powers you. The spirit. Because men were created as vacuums. We are created to be regulated by spirits. And so if you are functioning by any other spirit apart from the Holy Ghost, you joined a denomination. You are not part of those who will appear beyond the stars. And so your growth is the degree to which you master some of these resources that we are talking about. From life to faith to work with the Holy Spirit. And all of these things will require a kind of energy on your inside that is beyond motivation. That energy that powers you to grow and to master this reality is what we call the fire of God. But I won't go into fire yet. Let me use life, for example, to show you what God expects when he gave us eternal life. And it is the basis to which we will master this life that God will consider us as citizens of his realm. And so John said, what we met is the word of life. And so there is something life comes to do to you that makes you become different. But before you understand this, you need to even understand what is life, what is eternal life in the first place. You know, this is a theological document that is taught in many foundation schools. And when I started studying from the realm of God to find out what God defines these things for himself, I discovered there was an error in our doctrine. I discovered there was an error in our discipleship program. You know what they did? Because they couldn't attain God's standard, they lowered it. Sit down, please. They lowered it. Don't worry, sit down. Thank you. I don't want to be distracted. They lowered it and then created a doctrine to accommodate the standard they have created. And so you can be a Christian for a lifetime and not attain God's standard. When you begin to study eternal life, and I'm using this as a case study, just to reveal to you where we are. Because when I finish, I'm going to do a comparison between a believer and a witch. And then you will know that as touching spiritual knowledge, we are behind. Because this meeting you are having here, if this was a meeting of witches, nobody will come here with a car. And it's not a miracle. Everybody will teleport into this place and it will be normal. They will just appear here and when meeting is over, they will disappear and go home. And nobody will shout, it's normal. To show you how advanced in spiritual knowledge and intelligence they are in darkness. Me, I, we, we are doing denomination. We are doing programs. We are doing church meetings. And we think we are growing because the number is increasing. All that we are doing, church is almost becoming a social gathering. The, the, what, the only thing remaining for us to do, have now is social security number. For us to become a purely social organization. But you see, when you enter the demonic realm, they have maintained their heritage. You can't say you are a witch if you can't come for the meeting. And you don't come for a meeting through a boat. You don't come for a meeting through a car. You come for the meeting through a technology that is spiritual. And so when a witch is using handset, he's using handset because he wants to communicate to your world. In their world, they have maintained their heritage. They don't communicate through phones. They communicate through telepathic means. If one witch wants to talk to another witch, he will transmit it. The other witch will know the information and he won't need the phone. And so when they are using technology, they are using technology because they are relating with the world. They don't need technology in their world. In a witch meeting, everybody gets the information at the same time telepathically. The question is, what have they known that has made them to preserve their heritage? An apprentice witch of 10 years can scatter the family of a Christian who has been a Christian for 30 years. They send them on IT and a gear of 10 years can stand on the road and a family is traveling, traveling for Christmas and the car somersaults because she does her hand like this. And then we are bragging. I've been a Christian for 15 years. I've been a Christian for 30 years. And in the spirit, we are ignorant of spiritual reality. If our generation don't press into God for ourselves to find out what God kept there as our heritage 
our number will count for nothing. In my village today, if you're having a wedding, better settle the rainmakers. They will just come. If your reception is on this altar, if you don't settle them, they will bring rain here. If you relocate the reception, they will relocate the rain. It is a normal thing for them to manipulate weather and it's not a testimony. Everybody know. And so when you have occasion, you take pan wine there and settle them with money. And it's not a miracle. If one prophet stands today and says there will be no rain, we will talk about it for 10 years. We are backward. And the reason we are backward is because we have reduced spiritual knowledge to theology. If you say you have the life of God, what does God call that life that you say you have? And this is just one out of many things that defines who a Christian is. Before you come to church and shout and pray and sweat and say, I have done something. Do you know God's standard? Before you read the Bible and jump out and quote five scripture and pocket your hand and say, I'm a prophet. Have you seen God's standard? Do you know who God calls a Christian? In 1 John chapter 5, from verse 11 to 13, he said, this is the record. This is the record. What is the record? He said that God has given us eternal life. And he said that life is in his son. He said whoever has the son has life. And he said these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. Why is God so specific about eternal life? Because eternal life is one of the parameters that reveals to you that truly you belong to God. In 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, he said, whoever is born of God overcometh the world. He said, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So there is something God has put in us that the least of us should be an overcomer. The question is, why do you go to the hospital and find many Christians? It means they have not understood something about their birth, which is supposed to be the fundamental of our Christianity. And if we still don't understand the nature of life that we have, what discipleship have we received in the last 10 years? What is the implication of the meetings we have been attending for the last 10 years? You go to the hospital, all the admitted patients in a Christian state all carry Christian names. And it looks as if doctors are truly our messiahs. In fact, nowadays doctors will tell you, don't go and do anything any pastor tells you. Better take your medication. And if you are wise, you better take it. Because they have seen many people who stood up and said, I won't take, I won't take. And they died. They rushed them back to the same hospital. This is not about zeal. This is a reality in the spirit that we must begin to understand again. If God is starting a new move, we must learn these things. This is what Paul knew. This is what Peter knew. This is what the apostles of old knew. And if we have not known the basics, how can we handle the complex things of God? If I asked you now, what is eternal life? What will you say? If we took a census now and pick us at random and say, what is eternal life? What will you say? Meanwhile, you are coming for fire so that you can advance God's government over the territory of Oweri. By what life? You don't even know the life you carry. You have not mastered the life you carry. How do you think you can dominate your territory? This is not a zeal. When you step out, you will meet spirits. Real life spirits. And when they challenge you, better have something on the inside. Thanks for watching. If you're passionate about growth and knowledge and spreading conviction, subscribe to Growth Media for more content that's set to revive the media and entertainment space. Be a part of our vision.